is Mr. England there? Yes, speaking. Mr. England, this is Becky Dufault calling. How are you? Hi, Becky. I was expecting your call. You were? Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the time and talking to us this afternoon. Oh, no problem. It means a great deal to us. And uh, I didn't know if you had a chance to talk to Matt uh, in telling you uh, exactly what the angle that we're doing this on. Actually, no. I just knew that you were going to call. Matt didn't really discuss an angle. Okay. Well, what we're doing is we're writing a uh, article on horror films. And uh, the angle that we're looking at and the reason that we chose you as uh, the particular actor in this field, and that is because we want to find out from your expertise opinion uh, on horror films what you feel scare people, um, what scares you, things like that. And then we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing, um, you know, upcoming things you've got coming up and, and how you got in, in, into the industry and things like that and my husband terry is going to be on the uh other line with us okay. and uh he'll be talking and i'm going to be taking some notes as well okay great how are you doing robert Hi, Terry. How are you? i have to admit a couple of things we have in a room here is a freddie doll and your freddie record album oh hang on to that freddie doll i understand it's worth quite a bit of money now yeah you know they there was some sort of a canadian jerry falwell fellow who had them banned for a while, and uh, they got real valuable right after that. I remember a couple of years ago I was doing a, a Halloween special, mm -hmm. uh, and it was taped right across the hall from where uh, Pee Wee Herman was taping his show. And uh, he came running over with a whole box of them. He wanted me to sign. Mm -hmm. He was a big collector of toys and memorabilia, but uh, it was funny. He, had, he was one that told me that. He just heard that uh, they... Oh, they've gone up in value. They've gone up in value. I especially got a kick out of the record album. You have a good time doing that? Yeah, you know, that was a while ago. That was back around Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2. So, and I, I believe I did that out at, back in New York. But, I, yeah, I remember it was a lot of fun. The one I remember the most, though, was I, I laid down some tracks on um, uh, an Alice Cooper album mm -hmm. uh, before he became involved in Nightmare 6. This was, uh, this was a while back, too. And I drove somewhere out into the deep San Fernando Valley one night and I went through this security gate. And it must have been like 12 or 1 in the morning. It was real strange. The rock stars like to work at night. And I walked in this uh, recording studio, and there was Linda Ron's dad and Al Cooper and Mike Bloomfield and all these stars from the 60s that I remembered. You know, so it was kind of fun to, to hang out with Al. And, and, and I put some Freddie laughs on a couple of his, uh, his cuts. Hmm. Some general questions first about horror. Of course, horror is very popular, and you've definitely helped in that area to excel it to where it is. Why do you think that people like to be scared? Well, I think part of it is uh, uh, a kind of a fascination with the abomination. You know, uh, people, it's just part and parcel of our human nature. You know, we can't turn away from it. It's that thing about driving by an accident on the freeway. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the other thing is, uh, especially in, in, in horror films, and in, and in America specifically, uh, America d doesn't deal with, uh, uh, even though we're a, a rather violent society, we don't really deal with death well. Uh, we, we're, you know, we're sort of youth obsessed. Uh, we don't deal with um, our aging citizens very well. We tend to warehouse them in retirement homes, etc. And other cultures really don't understand that about us. So I think that one of the attractions subliminal attraction to the horror film, and that is it's sort of a, a, an unconscious way of dealing with death. Uh, I, I think because there's usually uh, the pursuit of a person in a, in a horror film that we identify with, and uh, the obvious outcome would be death. I, I think that it's a way to sort of like transfer uh, that fear we all have, and so sooner or later we're all going to die, and, and kind of have a little mini catharsis you know, in the dark for two hours at a matinee or at the local bijou, you know, and kind of, uh, uh, kind of get over that or deal with that or address that a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in this sort of um, <clears throat> surrogate way, you know, in this sort of like other way. We going to the movies is kind of our way in the American culture of dealing with it. I think that there's also the, the horror movie. I think has sort of become the equivalent, the cheap thrill equivalent of uh, of the old carnival, the old sideshow and freak show. It's sort of what we we have now in place of that in the culture. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the horror movie is sort of a, an approved uh, cheap thrill. I know in Europe it, it's very different. In Europe the horror movie is like jazz or the western. It's, it's very 
American cultural thing that, that is in fact respected a lot over there uh, as, a, as a, this kind of a wonderful American import, again, like the Western or jazz. Do you have any particular memories of watching horror films as a child? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is not the freshest quote you're going to get. I've, I've told this, but I mean, I can't make up, I, I could tell you a lie, but yeah, I remember I was in the third grade and there was a uh, uh, movie program on every night here called the Billion Dollar Movie or something like that. Or the, maybe it was the Fabulous 52. And it was on, uh, I think, Saturday nights or Friday nights. And uh, it was on late, I think. And I, I have this firm belief and theory that in those days, as a child growing up in the 50s, that, that movies were not edited and censored on television yet because they needed them to fill up this large block of time. There wasn't as much programming so that some guy could come on in the commercial breaks and you know, bang the hood of a car and sell used cars like a Cal Worthington or something. And I, the big, the big event was the so-called uncut uh, Frankenstein, uh, James Wales Frankenstein. And all the kids in my third grade, all the guys in my third grade, third grade class, I should say, this was a real rite of passage thing. We all were, you know, the thing was we were all going to try to get our parents to let us stay up late and watch it. And I remember my mom uh, let me stay up in the den that night and it was sort of past my bedtime and watched mm -hmm. Frankenstein and I was you know I was I was going along pretty good with it but I remember the sort of black and white German e expression it was kind of working on me a little bit subconsciously you know you know it was a strange I don't think I'd ever seen that before and the stylistic components of that kind of production design were kind of like working on me but I remember when, when uh, he picks up the hunchback and he kind of hangs him on the hook there where the monster does that really flipped me out and that image sort of stayed with me for a while and of course the following monday in school instead of discussing their most recent twilight zone which was sort of like the thing we would all talk about we all discussed frankenstein all through recess and standing in line before school and during the lunch hour it was the big you know the big thing mm -hmm. sort of uh, discussed and, uh, i agree i love the classic yeah. but that was a, that was a big event for me as a show sort of seminal horror film that I remember. And again, it, it, this is the, the the late 50s. This is the movie made in the 30s that was shown on television. So there was a sort of a, a distance and an attachment on it that was also uh, a kind of a re-release time or something. And uh, I remember it was very significant you know, that we all, all the, all the guys in the third grade had to see it. It was this big rite of passage. Do you think that horror films must follow a particular formula as to what they uh, must include to be one that would work or be actually scary? Well, I mean, I think there's certain uh, credibility factors that have to be answered, or in the terms of the classic horror films, films that deal with vampires and wolfmen and things like that, mummies, what have you, you there are certain uh, myths that have to be retold every time. They can mm -hmm. be, you know, updated, they can be modernized, they can be freshened, but they still have to be there. It's part of laying down the base uh, so that the snowball can begin to roll uh, and uh, sort of involve you. So in, in terms of those, I think, yeah. But I think there's always room for something, you know, completely mm -hmm. new and novel in a horror film. What? I do think the credibility factor, even in the most fantastic situations, I think there has to, and I'm not talking about necessarily naturalism as an acting style. I don't necessarily agree with that. It just sort of has to be a kind of a credibility uh, factor. I think that's one of the things that's, uh, so great about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. A, it, you know, it, it's very fantastic, and it, and, it, and, it, and it gets more fantastic as it progresses. But there's a kind of a wonderful credibility factor going on within that old hotel mm -hmm. uh, with the child uh, and the sort of hide and seek that's going on there uh, that really, really works on you as, a, as an audience. Why do you think that Freddy touched a particular nerve the way he did. It got so very popular. What did Freddy have that the others didn't have? Well, you know, I'm not so certain it's Freddy per se. I think Freddy has become the logo of an experience that is the nightmare on Elm Street. And I think that the reason the Nightmare on Elm Street films are so popular is because of the dream. And I think that it's so universal, the nightmare and the dream. We all dream at night. We've all had nightmares. It's something everybody can relate to in every language in every country in the world. And I think that's the universality of it, that it's this frightening concept that there could be some evil out there, 
lurking and, and existing in a kind of subconscious purgatory and know everything that you think and all your fantasies and all your fears and your flaws and your habits that are so private to you that uh, you know, exist, especially manifest in your, in your dreams, and that he knows those and can exploit them. And I think that the, it's that universality of, of everybody, everybody in the world had a bad dream at one time or another. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the idea that somebody could get in there and, and, and mess with that is, is, is a frightening concept. And of course, the thing, the evil, the, person, the personage that does that is Freddy. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, Freddie sort of becomes a stand for the experience, sort of a logo for the experience of, of, of a nightmare film. Since you started doing the films, have you had bad dreams? The only one I've ever had about, about nightmare, and, I, and I've, again, this is not a, another one of those stories, it's not fresh, but it, it's a pretty good story. I, uh, I was on location during the filming of Nightmare on Elm Street Part 1, and we were in uh, Hollywood somewhere late at night, and in fact, in that situation, we were shooting at night only, and so it, didn't matter. it wasn't a question of losing the light, it was a question of losing the night. Mm-hmm. We were trying to get this shot, and uh, they were setting up, and they let me go back to my honey wagon, my little trailer dressing room, to take a nap, because it must have been like, I guess, three or four in the morning. And uh, I rolled up, I was in, you know, my full Freddy drag <coughs> and makeup, and I rolled up a towel, you know, kind of, you know, the old way you used to roll up your swimming trunks mm-hmm. and how you'd carry them to the public pool or something. It's sort of like the Japanese do for a pillow. And I used that so that my makeup wouldn't smear because it's all around me and down under my chest. And I laid down on my cot and I had my, uh, the dimmer, on the, the lights around my makeup mirror on very, very low. They were just sort of ghosting in the honey wagon, just this little narrow trailer with a cot on one side, a big mirror and a counter. And these makeup lights around the beer, they were on very softly. And I fell asleep, and about an hour later, you know, to that, that hour before dawn, it's sort of strange. I heard this knocking at my door, and the assistant director said, you know, Robert, hurry up, you know, uh, you know, we need you. you know, we need you to get this shot. And I, I sort of yawned and kind of rose half asleep and half awake. And as I did, I, I looked into the mirror, and there in the half light was this old, decrepit, all this. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I forgot that I was in the makeup. Oh. Robert England, and the, and the AD was calling me by my name, Robert. And I was Robert England waking up, and, this, and I was kind of half awake, mm. still half dreaming, and it, and it scared the bejesus out of me. Oh, and man. I occasionally remember that moment, and it was and a lot. The reason I take so long to, to describe it is a lot of it had to do with me not being awake. Yeah. The AD saying, Robert, Robert, <laughs> not Fred. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been an actor for a long time. I've been many, many times when I've taken a nap in those rooms. But this was during the first film, and I wasn't used to wearing the makeup yet. And then also the fact that I wasn't really quite awake in the strange light that happens, you know, in those light bulbs when they're way yeah. low and a dimmer. <laughs> so oh. it was, and, and there's also that kind of, you know, that that distance that happens in a mirror. You know, you're like equal distance away from the mirror as you are on the other side. So I really look kind of far away. You didn't ever have to go home wearing the makeup, did you? No, I've never driven uh, around. I've driven to the makeup once, uh, but th- I wasn't driving. Uh, I drove, we actually drove down, I think it was Hollywood Boulevard, and we scared some prostitutes. <laughs> we were on our way to, to uh, a, a photo session, and I, and I had to leave the makeup on. And then I also, uh, I also wore it across the street once during part one, which is when I learned not to mess with it, because we walked into a Thai restaurant, I was just so sick of the catered food on location. I was having a hard time with it, too, with the, the makeup, and I thought maybe I'd just get some Thai food today. And uh, we all went across the street, and the bus boy was, in fact, not a, not a young man, but a very old man. And he came out of the swinging doors of the kitchen, and he saw me, and I scared him to death. <laughs> I think I sent him all the way back to his aunt. Jeez. And he was probably, you know, you know, an illegal alien and right off the boat. <laughs> I felt kind of terrible about it because, I mean, he really was scared. He dropped it. <laughs> Wow. The platter of food and everything. It was kind of weird. Let me... And I just looked up at the guy, you know, but it just startled him. It was just the timing of him coming out of the door and me looking up, and I just kind of, you know, heard the noise. And again, you know, after I did this makeup for hours, I kind of forget I have it on. And I'm, I'm rather nonchalant, but I think it really startled him the way I made eye contact with him. How long does it take to put all the makeup on? Well, you know, I've been... I've done a couple of recent makeups. I did that. Not real reasons, but... I did Phantom of the Opera yes. a few years ago, and then more recently I just finished a, a film called The Bangler, 
Uh, what was that again now? The Mangler. M-A-N-G-L-E-R, Mangler. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, actually, it, 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 there's a, a name of a, of a laundry machine called the Mangle. It's the actual name of a machine that uh, folds and steam cleans and uh, iron pressed sheets in a laundry, mm -hmm. old-fashioned industrial laundry. And this is a short story by Stephen King from the book Night Shift. Mm. And I just finished that. Uh, was that for a movie who then? Directed who did Poltergeist at Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, it stars myself and uh, Ted Levine, who played the transvestite from Silence of the Lambs. And I had a rather extensive makeup in that. So I, I did Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, or, or Wes Craven's New Nightmare, which comes out this Halloween. I did that afterward. And it seemed, the, the Freddy makeup, even though it's evolved again for, for this last Nightmare on Elm Street film, it, uh, the makeup uh, has evolved, but it, it, it still seems easier than, than the extensive makeup yeah. I did for, uh, for the Mangler. Uh, I think the makeup on the last uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, I think that takes, I think that we had that down to about three and a half, four hours. It's generally been between three and four hours, depending upon if they're you know, preparing me for an effect or uh, if they need me for close-ups right away. Um, when we did this series, the TV series, we modified a little bit, made it a little more simple. So I was able to get it on then in about two and a half or three hours. But generally speaking for the movies, the makeup has always taken between about three and a half and four hours. Wow. When you were approached to do the movie, you were basically a character actor before, right? Yeah, I was actually, at the time of uh, the first Nightmare on Elm Street, I was tasting uh, quite uh, uh, a dose of uh, my first foray into being a celebrity. I was starring on the television series V, the science fiction series, and I had sort of been singled out by the fans, my character, and I was really getting a lot of attention for that. I was attending Star Trek conventions and signing autographs with William Shatner and things like that. And because there was no Star Trek on television at that time, uh, we were sort of filling a void in the science fiction world. We were, I think, the only science fiction show on television at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really uh, experiencing some popularity. So the nightmare thing, the nightmare on Elm Street, really kind of took a back seat to all of that attention. And I didn't think much of it, you know, except that I worked with a bunch of extraordinarily talented people during the summer. And I knew we were on to something, that we had a kind of a nice little ensemble, but I thought it was going to be like a little cult film. Mm -hmm. Did you have any hesitation mm -hmm. at possibly getting involved with a makeup thing that might be an ongoing thing, no, worrying no, that maybe you wouldn't be recognized as yourself? No, I had done probably, gosh, I think I'd done close to 15 movies, maybe more. Uh, maybe uh, Between 15 and 20 movies at the time I had done, did the first Freddy. And also, I was starring in a series... I'd done an awful lot of television guest starring. I probably had done maybe a dozen uh, real prestige movies of, the, movies of the week by then. So, no, I didn't have any problem with that. I was quite established. Mm -hmm. I'd starred with Jeff Bridges and Sally Field and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Susan St. James and all sorts of people by then. I'd done a lot of stuff. So, no, that wasn't the problem at all. I mean, I, I literally did it because it fit in my schedule and I wanted to work for Wes. Mm -hmm. the reason I did the, it, it, I, when you're doing TV, you get these these things called hiatuses, mm -hmm. where you know that are in between uh, your your shooting schedule for the series and this film, this project, Nightmare on Elm Street Part One, just happened to fit perfectly into my hiatus. And I, you know, I was curious about work about Wes Craven. I kind of thought he was an interesting guy, and I, I wanted to see what it'd be like to work for him. Did you work for him because of his previous film, uh, Last House on the Left? Yeah, you know, I was sort of, there was a big, uh, this is 1984, and there was kind of a big uh, sort of music, punk rock, uh, rockabilly renaissance going on in Los Angeles at the time. It was really kind of a uh, real <coughs> second time uh, in the music scene then. Uh, and, and it was kind of fun to go nightclubbing in those days in L.A. still. And, uh, and I was, a, you know, I wasn't part of that scene, but I was certainly a witness to that scene. And, 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 I, and I remember Wes's movies were sort of playing surreptitiously, you know, in a couple of the clubs. And Wes was sort of like, uh, kind of considered cool and underground then. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the attraction. Did you ever imagine when you were approached about doing the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, did you ever imagine it would get uh, as big as it did, where now you're, what, into the... 
Well, we Fifth just or did, sixth? Uh, West Craven's New Nightmare, which is the seventh one. Seventh one? Yeah, we want to talk about that too in a um, second. No, you know, I really didn't. Have, I really didn't. I thought I knew we had done a really good job. Everybody worked real hard, and it was this really interesting. You know, I mean, I was hanging out with Johnny Depp, mm -hmm. and just got here from Florida, and Heather Langenkamp, who looked like everybody thought Brooke Shields should look. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Bronnie Blakely, who at that time was married to Vim Vendors, and West Craven. John Saxon, Charlie Fleischer was in that. Remember Charlie? You know the voice of Roger Rabbit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charlie's like really funny, and there was a wonderful actress named Amanda Wiss, mm -hmm. and a real interesting boy named Nick Corey, uh, and, and and then all the, the special effects guys who've gone on to become superstars. You know, Kevin mm -hmm. Yeager does Tales of the Crypt, and he directs, and he did Chucky, and all of that, and all of the the, the, the special effects guys have all gone on to become quite famous at Boss Films and everything. So, no, you know, and I, we all, I knew these people were all extraordinary. I mean, we all knew Johnny Depp was going to become a, you could just tell Johnny was like, a, just sort of like James Dean guy mm -hmm. walking around the back lot there, you know, and, and we all kind of knew we were on to something, but we, I don't think anybody thought it was going to be a hit. Mm -hmm. I think we thought it was going to be this hip little underground film. And again, I was so preoccupied with my success on V at the time. Uh, I was, you know, quite popular, and that was really, uh, it was a new experience for me, mm -hmm. and that was kind of a first for me, and so I really was dealing with that more than, than any, you know, I really didn't, I, I didn't have my first clue until um, it had been out for a while, and you, people tend to forget, you know, now, but there was no hype machine yeah. from New Line Cinema back then. I don't think the hype machine really began on these movies until sometime between two and three, and, you know, I joke about it, but I think there was just like, you know, it was sort of like in a, a sporadic regional release at that time. And I, again, I'm dealing with V and all my popularity. I was doing a talk show or something in New York, and I was signing autographs at the old Hotel Roosevelt in Midtown. And I, was, and I had a line of people, you know, getting autographs from me from V. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, these sort of like science fiction Trekkie type fans kind of changed into these heavy metal punk rock fans <laughs> and they all wanted a Freddy autograph mm. and they were bringing me like torn ads out of newspapers in upstate New York to sign and um, and like a couple of photos that they'd scrounged you know from from lobbies and movie theaters and stuff to sign and that's when I knew it was taking off because I, I think that line literally went went out of the Hotel Roosevelt that day, and, and, and I think, I can't remember if it was on Sixth Avenue or what, but it like literally went, started to go around the block, and I was signing <laughs> autographs with like some pretty big people, mm. and my, I had the longest line. Well, the thing that That's you... When I realized that, that, Freddie was, 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 that, that Freddie was beginning to take off. The thing that you have really achieved is your name, Robert England, is known as well as Freddie itself, to where like a lot of people cannot even name who played Leatherface or, or Jason or whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, I also think our movies are several... Uh, several rungs up the evolutionary ladder, you know, I mean... In what way? ...is that Freddie wears a glove mm -hmm. with nice fingers, and if I would swing that arm at somebody, the verb you'd have to use to describe what I'm doing is probably, I flashed at you. And there has been this word around forever called slasher movies. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, that's what has, you know, I, I think Freddie, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies have been lumped into that category, especially by a lot of uh, adult critics that forgotten what it's like to be, you know, a teenager mm -hmm. and uh, got a little bit yuppie judgmental and, and never even bothered to see these movies to realize that these movies are incredibly imaginative. Um, they're made on a shoestring and they look, you get more bang for your buck from a nightmare movie mm -hmm. than just about any other movie made for an equivalent budget. And yeah. on top of that, over the years, We've discovered the top talent in Hollywood, whether it's Johnny Depp or Rennie Harlan, the director, or Stephen Hopkins, who's responsible for Predator 2 and Blown Away, or whether it's Chuck Russell, who did Nightmare 3 and now has The Mask debuting tomorrow, or whether it's Rachel Palloway, who did Tank Girl and Ghost in the Machine, or of course Wes Craven or Jack Shoulder, or whether it's the actors like Patricia Arquette or Jennifer Rubin and these other people we've discovered. So, you know... I think it's unfair to lump our movies in, and I think that that there is a, a, a level of sophistication and imagination and mythology about these movies that has really made them uh, a much more of a footnote in horror history, uh, uh, on a par with with better films than let's say the typical ones. But I think 
part of it is with with what with, with me is that I had a, a nice a happy accident happen. So that happy accident is that I was I, I, I did V and then I did Freddy and everybody knew my face from V and from the talk shows. And the science fiction fans, there was a lot of them are crossover into horror. Mm -hmm. So I had a nice one two punch evolving into sort of snowballing success of these films and then when these films became universal and uh, <coughs> into Europe every year for the last 12 years because of these movies, the mm. last 10 years because of these movies, because they're so huge in Europe and Japan, <coughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I think that, that when, when that took off and that universality kicked in, I think people uh, saw me in the talk shows, remembered me from other, other acting jobs, and put the name together with the performance. I think I also maybe brought a kind of an interesting body language. Yeah. And a, a, a kind of, you know, a, 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 I don't, I don't think human. I always, I never played Freddy like Freddy thought he was a monster. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think Freddy thinks he's a monster. I think Freddy's, you know, fairly arrogant. Uh, he has some problems, obviously, but he's fairly arrogant, and he certainly enjoys his his reign of terror. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think the audience uh, likes to kind of anticipate. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, creatively going to do away with somebody? Were you or the studio ever very concerned with the child killer theme? Well, you know, it was a child killer, I'll be honest with you. Uh, he originally was a child killer who, in fact, uh, you know, we like to, everybody likes to blame the lawyers. He gets off on a, on a, on a legal loophole, on a, on a legal technicality uh, somehow, and uh, then the, the vigilante parents burn him alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and. What, what happened was, at the, the time we were making the movie, uh, there was a terrible uh, scandal in uh, the sort of South Bay mm -hmm. cities here in Los Angeles uh, with, a, with a, a daycare center that, that, that was some child molestation. And uh, uh, New Line and I think Wes and I think everybody was a little nervous about the audience or the, the, the public thinking that we exploited that in yeah. a way. It's a pretty horrific, strange case. And so it's always been kind of soft, played down, you know, that that was the original, you know, crimes of Fred Krueger, that he was a child killer. But in fact, it is. And, it, and, and part of that is a kind of a, a mythic, Germanic, uh, kind of cautionary tale, like an old fairy tale thing. You know, that's that kind of, you know, Fred Krueger. Krueger's a German name, and he's a boogeyman, and he comes in your dreams, and if you're not good, it's, it's, it's like... You know, the original Hansel and Gretel, in fact, is a real cautionary tale from uh, a famine-stricken Germany where the children literally, Hansel and Gretel, are literally forced to leave the house because there's not enough food for them. Hence the breadcrumbs and, and the gingerbread house and all that. That's almost like a hunger hallucination that the children have. I mean, those, those old fairy tales, you know, yes. Bruno Bettelheim aside, they're pretty hardcore stuff. Absolutely. And I think that this is part part of what Wes was planting in the mythology of Freddy and the sort of subliminal Freudian Jungian thing there. So, you know, I mean, I don't think we really had a problem with it, but we were certainly soft-pedaled it because of, of, of this sort of simultaneous scandal that was going on in this crime uh, in Los Angeles. It didn't want to look like, even though Wes had written this years before that thing occurred, we didn't want it to look like, you know, he had like, exploited that or anything. Did you get many protests at all? No, you know, over the years there's been a couple of bogus uh, uh, news reports and media reports about that. I, I can remember uh, recently, maybe two or three years ago, being in New York, and, and I heard there was a protest out here, you know, I was mm -hmm. you know, doing the publicity in New York for it, Right. and there was a you know, simultaneous you know, release all over America. And I got back out here, and, and my friend uh, had it on the news, you know, showed me the news, uh, he taped it off the news. And it was like, you know, 50 reporters and like three housewives. <laughs> you know, had it been 50 housewives and three yeah. reporters, I would have said that, that news. Definitely smelled a setup, yes. Yeah, but it was really, you know, and, and that was just, that was, that was just bogus. You now, know? Uh, you really has, I think there was like one protest in Canada that, 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 that was the only true thing that ever happened, you know, about this. But the, the tragedy is that there are so many... I mean, you sound really knowledgeable about, about the genre, but there are, I cannot tell you how many talk shows I've done in major cities in this country, you know, AM Saskatchewan, At Noon with Houston, you know, things like that, where these shows exist completely on the work of, of we folk in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and they could not live without our product and without our clips and, and, and this sort of 
publicity bill. And of course, they're good for us too. But I, I would think that at least they would find time to see the, 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 the product they talk about or the product they dismiss, you know, and they don't. You know, mm -hmm. you can tell that many times they haven't even seen the movies. Mm -hmm. Do you find a lot of times that they treat it like it's fluff? Well, they'll, 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 they will criticize horror films not having even seen them, yeah. you know, as being bad. And there's a real big difference between horror films. There's some, I know there's some real crap out there, yeah. but there's also some terrific stuff. And I'm not, I mean terrific hardcore underground stuff as well as terrific, you know, A, B feature stuff. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I saw an amazing film last year called Dust Devil by Richard Stanley, who directed Hardware. And it's a hardcore film, and it's violent, and it's got some, you know, some, some gore in it, but it's just amazingly done. And, and, and Hardware also, I felt he did his terrific film, you know, and, and, and yet, you can, you know, they, they sort of dismiss these films out of hand, mm -hmm. you know, because they see one clip, you know, and it's violent, and they don't, you know, it's like, it's like the Freddy movies sometimes get dismissed and thrown in just as a sort of a low-budget slasher film, yeah. in fact. Mm -hmm. I don't think Freddy has slashed anybody since part one. Now he exploits everybody's flaws. You know, if you're afraid of a cockroach, he turns you into a giant cockroach. If you're afraid of bugs, he turns you into a, to a, to a cockroach. Freddy's not out there, you know, gutting people and drinking their blood. No. Well, I'm so glad to hear that you have the respect that you do for the genre, because I, I share in that. I you really know, love the feel. I had to rediscover it. I'll be frank with you. I mean, I don't rush out and see every horror movie the first night. Yeah. I rent them. I discovered them on the late show and on cable, but I've, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty up to date on them. And in fact, I often, uh, at, at on talk shows and conventions and interviews, recommend some that I think have sort of slipped through the fingers of people, whether they're thrillers or horror shows or science fiction. Uh, uh, a film made a couple of years ago called White of the Eye with David Keith and, and Kathy Moriarty. It's a terrific little kind of psychological thriller, almost in the kind of serial killer horror genre. And, and, and I take my time to, like, find, seek these out and recommend them, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'll have to be honest. I had to re sort of rediscover the genre because after Nightmare 1, you know, I was really asked a lot of yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was uh, a, a series of films and a period of films that I was not current on, on current on. And I had to go back and, and, and kind of, you know, catch up a bit. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I mean, I've always loved, like, for instance, one of my favorite films of all time of any film is... Uh, uh, the wonderful one with Deborah Carr, The Innocence, uh -huh. you know, which I think is just one of the greatest horror films ever made, They're especially one of the greatest ghost films, and yet, and, and, and nothing is revealed, it's just all done subliminally, you know, and in editing. You know, one of the, uh, the turn of the screw, you know. Yes. One of the films that I really loved that you had a party in was Eaten Alive. Oh, yeah, Toby's film, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was fun, that, you know, and you know, I gotta tell you something about that, I had some trepidation about that, because... I don't know. I, at that time, I, I, I did not. The, the producers of that, uh, at the time, uh, it, it was quite low budget, and uh, I wasn't sure if they were going to kind of hold up their end of the bargain. And I, got, I walked on this set, and it was shot at that lot, Raleigh Studios, across the street from Paramount. And Raleigh Studios hadn't yet, uh, you know, been very successful, and they hadn't spent all their money on this big facelift they've had. Now, now they've got one of the most fun commissaries in town. It's like a little Mexican cantina on the back lot. You know, of course, there's a couple of great old bars and a couple of great old Mexican restaurants in that neighborhood now and stuff. Uh, the famous Lucy's, El Adobe, and things like that. But I, uh, I when I was on that lot working for Toby, and I had just finished the biggest movie made in Hollywood, I just starred with Jeff Bridges and Sally Field and for Bob Rafelson in Stay Hungry. And Bob Rafelson, of course, at that time, was like the hottest, coolest director in the world because of Five Easy Pieces. And I was just really had, I had all my eggs in that basket. I was, you know, and I, I had literally beaten out Gary Busey and Sylvester Stallone for my part. <laughs> and I was, just, you know, waiting for that to come out. And this little horror movie came up, and it really seemed interesting. And I really, again, I really wanted to work for Toby Hooper. But I still had a little, I was, you know, you were asking me about if I had any trepidations about Nightmare. Well, I never did, but I did have a little bit of trepidation about this film. I take it you'd I, seen I uh, Chainsaw. That over at, old, at the old Raleigh Studios, which was all kind of great old-fashioned rundown Hollywood. Mm -hmm. and, and I walked on that set, and, the, and it was one of the most phenomenal sets I've ever walked on in terms of the set. It was this old Victorian ranch, kind of like the, a shrunken version of the, uh, of the ranch in Giant. Yeah. You know, and it was there, and there was tumbleweeds and giant iguanas and lizards and, 
and things, and, and, and oh, it was just so weird, an old metal brand, you know, walking around, getting himself in character, and uh, Carolyn Jones, who I'd idolized for years, and, and it, I just really had a great time on that. Uh, there were some problems towards the end where Toby had a run in with the producers, and I think that the, the last week of shooting was done by the editor. So, it, you know, it, it, even though it's Toby's film, you know, he really didn't get to do the last sort of week yeah. of shooting. There was a big brouhaha. And, and, and Toby's so great. I wish they'd have just left him alone. The little girl on that, she blew me away. Yeah. Whatever happened to her, do you know? I don't know, but you know the actor in that that I love? He played the father. He's also in my favorite uh, horror film, which is uh, Brian De Palma's Sisters, uh, William Findlay. He was also in uh, Phantom of the Paradise, mm -hmm. the other De Palma film, which is you know, his take off on Phantom of the Opera. Uh, and uh, Bill Findlay, I just thought, was great in that. He's sort of nerdy, the nerdy suburban guy. And he's also, I think, the best mad scientist ever. Uh, even, you know, I think he's the, the best mad scientist ever in, uh, in Brian De Palma's Sisters. Did you have a good time doing the Mangler? Yeah, you know, the thing about the Mangler... What's that about? Well, you know, it, it, it's, again, it's the, it's the short story from Stephen King's uh, uh, book, Night Shift. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the story of uh, an antique laundry machine. Uh, okay. Iron and presses sheets. And it's been accidentally cursed. Uh, <laughs> the curse is uh, Blood of Virgin, Eye of Pat, Hand of Glory, and what happens is it's in an old warehouse, and a bat accidentally flies in the machine and gets and dies, so it's got the eye of bat, and then a girl pricks her finger on it, and she just happens to be a virgin, and uh, a little old lady drops her tablets in it, <laughs> and uh, her tablets are, are dye gel, and the active ingredient in dye gel is belladonna. And the other word for Belladonna, of course, is Hand of Glory. So this machine is accidentally cursed. And I played the sort of old, aging, Everett Sloan, lady from Shanghai capitalist <coughs> of, 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 of indeterminable age uh, with my polio leg braces, and I've got a voice box, and I'm real old and uh, crippled. And uh, I'm... There may or may not be a kind of a secret society in this town, uh, a, a sacrificial society, mm -hmm. and they appease the machine with sacrifices like every 16 years, but then the machine is accidentally cursed and uh, through these events, and so it begins to really uh, sort of uh, act on its own, and it's real strange. But we, we were supposed to shoot it in Toronto in an old brewery, uh, doubling as a, a laundry. And then at the last minute, our producer, who is producing the Michael Jackson concert in Africa, in South Africa, uh, right after they lifted the sanctions, he had to rush back there because of all the brouhaha over Michael Jackson. And so we had to finish, we had to do the movie in Africa, so we all had to go to Africa and they wow. built the sets and everything there. So we did it over there, and that made it more difficult. But it, I've seen it, and it's terrific. It's a real great atmospheric. And, and Ted Levine who was the transvestite in Sounds of the Lambs, sort of plays the New England cop in this way. You know, he's sort of like the, the you know, uh, kind of uh, hungover uh, New England cop from the small town, and he's terrific. He gets to play a good guy. This will be out on Halloween? Uh, I don't know when this is coming out. I know uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare will be out October 21st, so it's definitely a, a Halloween movie. But I'm not sure. I think Columbia is going to pick it up, but I'm not sure when it's coming out. Okay, tell us about the new Freddy movie. I got to hear this. Well, this is strange. You know, it's sort of a nightmare within a nightmare. It's it's about making Nightmare on Elm Street Part Seven, and Bob Shea, the head of New Line Cinema, and uh, plays himself, and Wes Craven plays himself, and I play myself, and Heather Langenkamp, who is the star of the movie, stars as herself in the movie. She plays Heather Langenkamp. Wow. And it's about. Heather, it's about Heather's reluctance to do another Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Oh, wow. Oh, because wow. of various things that are going on in her life, and she has a young son now, and she's not sure it's right to do, you know, these violent horror movies. 
and these various things begin to strange things begin to happen. And and while we were making the movie, the L.A. earthquake hit. The West incorpor- incorporated the L.A. earthquake in the movie. Mm. So like you really see real aftershocks in the movie, and then we also staged our own, of course. But it's real strange, you know. Uh, you just don't quite know what's going on. Who, you know, you don't know whether Robert England is really contributing to. Uh, maybe maybe Robert England is is is. Is, is harassing Heather, you know, uh, maybe, you know, West, maybe Wes Craven is in on it, maybe he's not, maybe they're manipulating her to do this movie, um, and, and what the, the movie really does, in fact, is it's no longer, uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies are over now, we're no longer on Elm Street, we're no longer in this mythic, uh, symbolic town of Springwood, uh, we've brought Freddy, the sort of urban myth you know, that's pulled around campfires in summer camps. This, you know, Freddy Krueger, the sort of equivalent of the, the hook man that terrorizes Lover's Lane. Mm-hmm. The sort of, you know, Freddy Krueger, who's now the kind of 90s alligators in the sewer, urban myth now. Freddy is now lifted out of the fantasy world of, and, and that he's been imprisoned in, of, of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And he's out in reality now. He's in the cinema verite, Hollywood reality now he's 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 out he's unbound he's freddy unbound <laughs> and uh he's the makeup has evolved and everything and is it, it different yeah yeah it's really it's really strange he's almost he's still burned and disfigured and everything but he's almost as if he's idealized himself into the best possible superhero version of a burned disfigured monster you know uh he's almost you know he's come out he's you know, it's strange. He's almost mm. Hollywoodized himself. <laughs> so long as it's, and it's, it's really strange and wonderful and interesting. Everybody was pretty well led to believe that the last Freddy movie was the last, and we'd well, never see him again. It is the last Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, but okay. It's not the last Freddy. Oh, okay. You see, there's no more Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes. The new movie is Wes Craven's new nightmare. We're not on Elm Street. We're not in Springwood. We're not, do- you know, it's nothing to do with Freddy revenging himself on the parents of Springwood or their relatives or their offspring any longer. The mm. revenge cycle, Nightmare on Elm Street is done. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 6, Freddy's Dead, was the last Nightmare on Elm Street. But Freddy has resurrected. Taking this new direction that Freddy's taking, is Wes going to go on with this, or does he foresee this as the last one know. of this type? I mean, obviously Wes and New Line have buried the hatchet and are working together again. Um, but I know right now Wes is doing a, a big Eddie Eddie Murphy movie, mm-hmm. so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if Wes has any plans to do any more, uh, 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 you know, nightmares. I've got to ask you this: there has been a rumor going around, including on USA, that, that show they have, Hollywood Insider, and everything. There's going to be a movie with Freddy, Jason, and Leatherface together. What about this? Well, I don't know, but I've never heard about Leatherface. Um, I, I don't know. I can't remember if New Line Cinema, and you could check this, uh, owns the rights to. Uh, uh, Chainsaw Massacre. I know they released the last one, the one with Dennis Hopper. Uh, however, uh, I do know they own the rights to Friday the 13th now. Mm-hmm. And I have heard that there is a script called Freddy Meets Jason. But I haven't read it and I haven't seen it. Would you like to do something like that if it well, became a possibility? I mean, I'd have to read it first. Yeah. I'd have to see. You know, what's been wonderful for me each time out, and people wonder, you know, first of all, I only do Freddy once a year. And sometimes there's a year and a half in between sometimes even two years and and you know the, the making of a movie is only you know two months out of my life but uh every time i go to do one of these i meet all these phenomenal new people you know i've worked with yafet kato i've worked with patricia arquette i've worked with jennifer rubin i've worked with johnny depp you know i get to work with all these great kids you know mm-hmm. friends of mine now and and these great special effects people whether it's kevin yeager or david miller you know, these wonderful, gifted uh, people that have, you know, done Coneheads and Chucky and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and the Tales of the Crypt and Thriller of the Video and all these other various uh, uh, things. And, and so I, get, I work with these people and, and, and the cameramen on, on Nightmare is always going. The directors are all the superstars now in Hollywood are all the Nightmare on Elm Street directors, quite literally. I mean, right now you have The Mask and Blown Away uh, are, are directed by two uh, alumni and Rennie Harlan, of course, you know, mm-hmm. does everything from producing Rambling Rose to directing Die Hard 2. And mm-hmm. so, so these are all Nightmare on Elm Street alumni. 
and Wes Craven, obviously, doing the new Eddie Murphy movie now. So I, every time I go to work, I'm working with all this great talent pool that's assembled by New Line. And uh, this is a great, great treat for me. So, you know, I, I'm sure that New Line would assemble a great imaginative mm -hmm. crew again, and that would be the attraction for me if the script was ridiculous, you know. I was trying to remember if you mentioned the title of the new Freddy movie here. The new one? Yeah. Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Okay, that's a perfect that's what it's title. Called. Wes Craven's New Nightmare. I really enjoyed the series Nightmare Cafe. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, you know, that's another reason I'm involved with the, the, the New Nightmares, because during the filming of that up in Vancouver, this, this project came alive, and Wes Craven and New Line of Cinema got back together again. And uh, I, it's one of the great disappointments of my life. I had a great crew. I was working with Wes Craven's staff, and Wes Craven's staff are just like the best in the business. Mm -hmm. Just wonderful people to work for. Marianne Madalena, who's been with him as far back as Serpent in the Rainbow, and uh, they're just great people. And uh, I thought it was a great show. I thought it was the new Twilight Zone. I wish it had a different title. I wish it would have been called, you know, maybe, maybe Terminal Cafe or something like that. Uh, yeah. For any kind of Nielsen rating. So I was real disappointed. And you know, the other thing was our ratings weren't that bad. I think we were like around, we were anywhere between like about 38 and 46 in the ratings. And there were a lot of shows that were way below us that are yeah. still on the air. I mean, I love the talent on Picket Fences, but I don't think they got the formula right on that show. And Picket Fences, nobody's watching Picket Fences and it's still on the air, you know? You think that's one of the basic problems with horror sci-fi on network television? They don't give it a good slot? No, no, it, it, that show wasn't really horror. That show was pure fantasy. You know, I mean, we had comedy episodes, we had some real serious family episodes. We had that wonderful episode about the, uh, about the African-American family that was reunited, mm -hmm. uh, the death of a child, you know. No, I think it was more like a Twilight Zone fantasy show. No, I, I think that I know for a fact that we were held up in the industry uh, as, an, as an icon of production value. They made every other show at the network look at our shows for production value in terms of how good that show looked, mm -hmm. okay? But again, there's no way to measure. And I think what happened was they just were so committed uh, you know, the, the shows they kept on instead of us were great shows. You know, uh, Picket Fences and I'll Fly Away. Mm -hmm. um, but we had higher ratings, and it was. And, and, and I don't mind being being a sacrificial lamb for a show like I'll Fly Away, mm -hmm. uh, even though it went to PBS and was canceled. But the fact of the matter is now, two or three of the shows that were kept on when we were sacrificed, they're off the air now, and we. I think we could have got. I think they should have put us behind. Uh, Oh, what's the fantasy series, uh, you know, where the guy goes, Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap. I think we should have been after Quantum Leap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that the two of us together, I think Quantum Leap would still be on the air. And I think we would have been a one-two punch for science fiction and fantasy fans. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a huge mistake. And I, you know, I, I think it was a terrific show. And I, you know, I'm broken hearted. I, I, it took me maybe three to four months to get over that because... I was working in one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Vancouver. I was working for this, just the creme de la creme of a company, uh, headed by Wes and, and Marianne, and uh, it, was, it was really sad, you know? Yeah. Do you think the new exposure on sci-fi and their uh, sci-fi series collection might possibly bring it back, maybe? Well, it's, it's, it's going to be on the sci-fi cable. Mm -hmm. It's already set to be on the sci-fi cable. So that's a positive thing. But it won't come back for any more than the episodes that have been done, I don't think, because mm -hmm. I don't think they have the budget. Yeah. Uh, to do the show the way West needs to do. How would you describe your character on Nightmare Cafe and, like, perhaps reference to Freddy or whatever? How well, different is it? not at all. I mean, there's nothing in common with Freddy. Yeah. Uh, except perhaps for the fact that he's dead. I mean, yeah. he was dead. He was a ghost. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he, he's sort of in a suspended <coughs> animation uh, in a, a, a kind of a, a purgatory, uh, if you will. It's almost as if he was like a bad angel and... Uh, was sort of, uh, he's sort of required uh, to, to work in the cafe, which is a kind of a, uh, again, a kind of a bus stop in purgatory, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a coffee shop for people uh, either on their way down or on their way up, mm -hmm. or people that have one last chance to sort of have a kind of, have done something in their life where they, they, they either deserve to be punished or they deserve to sort of uh, find some resolution in their life. So Blackie, my character Blackie, uh, was actually, we, we sort of decided that he was a, a gambler from the turn of the century, that maybe had, had died cheating, 
But in fact, down underneath all that, uh, they were sort of a heart of gold. And uh, he, he was sort of left there to kind of manage the cafe. And then after a while, and, and, he, and he's sort of like working off, you know, his points. Uh, he's sort of like a black angel or a dark yeah. angel and sort of working off his debits uh, in his life. And then, uh, and, and sort of maybe sooner or later, he would have like handed it over to uh, the other characters, you know. How well did the Phantom movie do for you? Phantom of the Opera was a huge, huge hit on video. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it was, you know, a resounding success domestically uh, in the United States. I think it made between eight and ten million, but then again, it only cost, I think, two and a half. So it certainly made some money domestically, profit-wise, and and then there's all the movie money it made overseas added to that plus. But I mean, it was a really big hit on video, so that was good for me. We sort of uh, we sort of found our audience. Uh, in the rental market. I didn't get a chance to see that film, but a lot of people compared the makeup with Freddy, but it wasn't really the same, was oh, it? it wasn't anything like that. You know what the tragedy was with that is that, uh, I don't know whether, I think it was canon, uh, when they, the poster for it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the poster for it, it it's like a, a, they, they found a moment of time in that movie where I, I, I revealed the most destroyed part of my face. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm which is like in the movie for like just a second. I mean, I never looked like that in the movie except for that second where he takes off the mask at the opera yeah. for just that one second. And I think when they, when they made the poster, they enhanced it a little bit with more red, you know? Mm-hmm. And it looks a little bit like Freddy. But then their makeup had nothing at all, even remotely looked like Freddy. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, and that's sort of like hurt me that they exploited that a little bit. Yeah. And I think it was wrong to do. But the people that saw the movie certainly don't think that. Because in the movie, no, 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 he's, the concept of the makeup was that there was this disfigured face. Uh, and then, you know, like burned by acid or something. And then, and, and, and a very different disfigurement than Freddy. It, looked, it was a very different effect. So you think then, the poster probably... Yeah, and then, and, then he had, uh, and then a bald head with stringy hair. Yeah. Like the Crypt Keeper. And then what he would do is he would apply... Uh, he would sew a, a makeup face using makeup and things that he had found in the bowels of the Paris Opera. Or in, in our case, the London Opera. Mm-hmm. Covent, Covent, Covent Garden. He would, he would use makeup and stuff that he'd stolen there, living down there in the lair beneath the opera. And he would, like, um, sew skin all over his face in a patchwork and then put makeup over that. And he sort of idealized himself into kind of like a beautiful face. And, and we got the idea, the inspiration from those busts of Beethoven. Yeah. You know those busts of Beethoven you've seen? Sure. With the long flowing hair? So that's sort of what he looked like. He sort of looked like Beethoven with Frank <coughs> And a little bit over made up, so it made him look kind of, you know, that kind of new romantic look with his mm-hmm. really pale and just a little bit of eye makeup, coal, coal eyeliner around the eyes. But then he had all this flowing hair, and of course it was a wig. You see the wig, you see him doing it in this really painful scene. You see him making himself presentable so that he can go to the opera. And then he kind of wears his scarf over his mouth to cover the stitching. Hmm. I have to see that for sure. You yeah. mentioned that, that you were a fan of some of the classic monsters like Frankenstein, let's say, for instance. Uh, Phantom of the Opera certainly is a classic monster. Is there any others that you would like to portray that you haven't had a chance to? Well, you know, I don't really um, think of of the monsters. Or, you know, I mean, I, I was supposed to do The Mummy, and, and uh, there was a, a scheduling conflict, and, and a, a problem with the director, and an actor died. Various things happened, and, and I didn't get to do it, but... You know, I, I, again, that would have been a stretch. I was looking. I was, you know, um, no, you know, I, it's, it's strange. I don't really think of those characters. There has been some talk of me doing the Hunchback of Notre Dame for European television, a four-hour version, and, and part of the gimmick is that they're going to really uh, go back to the novel with the whole thing and really deal with the whole story, and especially the fact that Esmeralda the Gypsy was a Jew, mm-hmm. a Jewish Gypsy. And that when she takes sanctuary in the Catholic Church in Notre Dame, that's a real, you know, that's that to make that, that that's really an amazing thing, you know, that, that that a Jewish girl in those times would take sanctuary there. And uh, and there has been some talk. And uh, I have wanted to. Uh, my 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 input has been that I don't want to wear a lot of face makeup. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe 
maybe having something wrong with my mouth. I don't know, maybe the corner of the eye. But what I want to do is I want the I want to re, I want I don't want to play the monster of Notre Dame. I want to play the hunchback. I want to have a really amazing hump hump de- designed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I wanted it to start out of the lower back of my head, right above the vertebrae. And I wanted you to see the vertebrae, like mm. almost like the beginning of a stegosaurus mm-hmm. thing coming out. Do you think I that really you wanted to make it a physical performance, yeah. more than a monster makeup? Oh. Do you think that your status in Hollywood now that you're much bigger, of course, and when you start out, gives you the opportunity to have the input like you're talking about with designing makeup and well, giving no, suggestions? Yeah, certainly with makeup. Yeah, in fact, I learned a lesson on uh, the Mangler. Um, our producer didn't like the eyebrows, and so my makeup man, who's not my normal makeup man that went with me, you know, sort of bowed to the producer and uh, tried to break them down a bit. And uh, there are several shots in the movie where I don't like them. You know, they look kind of zebra-striped. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Supposed to, I just wanted big, white George Bernard Shaw eyebrows. That was my conception. And I don't know why I didn't demand just somebody to shut up. They didn't know what they were talking about. But, you know, I'm getting old now, and I'm just... You know, it's, Can I'm, I ask how old? I'm known as a, as a sort of Johnny One Take pro. You know, uh-huh. Robert England, everybody likes him. He never gives him any trouble. But I'm just not going to take any, any crap from people anymore about things I don't know anything about. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Toby didn't stick up for me because he was getting it from the other end. Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, from now on, I'm just... Because I know I, I have a certain reputation at stake now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I, I like my performance and I like the makeup. But there are a couple of shots where the lighting isn't right. There was another thing with I well, you know, I don't want to get into it. There's like another thing where they where they where they they, they wanted more red on a, on a certain aspect of the makeup, and, mm-hmm. and, and I, I should have not let them do that either because it's it's not that it looks false. It's just it's confusing to the audience what they used it for. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's never brought up and it's never talked about in the story of the movie, and so it's a, it's confusing now. And they, you know, it's like if you're gonna bring something up, you have to bring it up. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can't just you know. And, and so I'm a little disappointed with that, although it's, 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 it's a terrific design by David Miller. It's just, it's, you know, that when you're in Africa and you don't have your normal uh, applicator there and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. it can get a little strange. Do I dare ask what age I you are? I have a lot of input. I have to learn to, you know, to, to kind of demand more now because I yeah. do have an aesthetic with this stuff. I worked in it for 10 years. Wow. Do I dare ask what age you are? I'm 45. You're not old. I'm very close to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm feeling old. You know what it is? It's just I just can't. I just can't do those stunts anymore after the second or third take. You know. Yeah. yeah. Black and blue. Let me ask you this. Uh, do you have any children? No. No. You are married, though. I'm married. Damn deep, my wife. My wonderful wife. What does she think about your career? Oh, she's she's amused. She loves it because you know, I, I'm really big in Europe. Well, especially Italy and Spain. Uh-huh. And I'm also you know pretty pretty big in in London. And but I mean it's amazing. I can go everywhere. I've even, there's even like little uh, Valium uh, keychains uh, with my picture on them in, in, in Russian. It says, take one and he will come for you. But, wow. you know, I've been mobbed in, in, in the Summer Palace in St. Petersburg, and I've been mobbed in, in, I've been recognized by punk rock bus boys behind the Iron Curtain in Budapest, Hungary, and quite literally uh, mm. uh, uh, in Italy. In Italy and Spain, they have a great love for the horror genre. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I go to Europe once once or twice a year. I do a movie a year over there, or I, or I go to film festivals and stuff. So, And Nancy, you know, we really love to travel. And, uh, uh, Does she go with you all the oh, time? Yeah, she always goes with me. How'd you meet? Pardon? How'd you meet? I was directing a movie called 976 Evil, and she was the set decorator. Wow. Does she mind uh, when fans come up to you, and do you mind? Oh no, you know, you know. The thing is, I'm uh, for better or for worse, I'm a B movie star, mm-hmm. and uh, the, when you're a movie star, it's different than being a TV star. People mm-hmm. give you a little more respect. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're in TV, it's you're in people's living room all the time. Mm-hmm. But movies, you know, uh, especially even though I know everybody's seen, you know, Freddie on cable or they've rented Freddie. Uh, you're still, it's still a movie, and they, there's a little more distance, you know, and it's, it's, it's always Mr. England and the fans, you know, I've never had a problem with the Nightmare on Elm Street fans. I, mm-hmm. I had a problem with some V fans, you know, but never Nightmare on Elm Street, and you would think that I would, but it's, it's actually just the opposite. The only mm-hmm. problem I ever had was with fans from, uh, from V. What did they do? I just, it wasn't like a problem so much as I just, there was like a girl who was really obsessed. Uh, a David Letterman type thing? No, this girl literally was trying to turn herself into the character I played. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. 
she's fine. I mean, you know, she just got real obsessed yeah. you know, with, with the character and mm -hmm. what he stood for. And uh, she was real bright and everything, and she's fine now. And she, I just made her channel her energy into writing, you know, because she, she was really a bright kid. Mm -hmm. Just a real bright, you know, like a really bright Trekkie. Yeah. You know, but, but really, really was into the whole spiritual thing of the, what that character stood for that I did on V. And so she just sort of like, she got her hair permed like me and started wearing the, the outfit and stuff. What know? do fans mostly say when they approach you? I imagine it's pretty much the same thing, huh? Well, most of them, most of them have had a seminal experience, you know, a drive-in movie or a great experience seeing one of the movies when they were young and it scared the you-know-what out of them. Mm -hmm. And they love that. They remember it as a fond, nostalgic moment. Uh, and, and that's made me realize that, 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 that it, you know, if, if we're anything, if the Nightmare on Elm Street movies are remembered for anything, they were sort of the last, one of the last great uh, popular culture uh, things that the kids discovered themselves. Yeah. It wasn't forced on them. Again, you know, there was no hype machine for the first two movies. And I think that, I mean, I know the second movie made, just in America alone, made like $40 million, And it cost like $2 million. So, you know... This is a lot of profit, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not even talking about video or anything now. <laughs> and th there was no hype machine. It wasn't for you know the, the, the teenagers discovered and found these cool little movies on their own. It was a grassroots thing, and mm -hmm. I think that there's this kind of nostalgic memory yeah. for you know seeing a Nightmare on Elm Street movie in the drive-in or at the walk-in or on a first date with a girl. You know, it's a great date movie where the girl gets scared and you. You can put your arm around her or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were cool, and they liked some of the lines from the movies. People are always asking me to write down some of the lines in the movies on the autographs. But I, I, I think that also there's a, a – even though they became uh, – there became a, a, a momentum of publicity and attention around them, and, that now, and now, I mean, you know, Johnny Carson did Freddy Krueger jokes, and Jay Leonard does Freddy Krueger jokes, and Dave Letterman does Freddy Krueger jokes, and, and I've been in, you know, uh, what's his name, you know uh, – God, the, the, the great cartoonist, the, the, the black comedy cartoons. Uh, Doonesbury? No, no, the black comedy stuff. Mm, I'm you not sure. The, the real weird kind of sick humor cartoons. I've been in, I've been in, in famous cartoons. I've been in Doonesbury. I've been in all. I've been in Playboy. You know, yeah. aside from you know my interviews and everything, Freddy Krueger has mm -hmm. been. He's through the culture now. He, That's right. People use him. He's probably going to be in the dictionary someday. Mm -hmm. You uh, know, and. Uh, uh, he's really entered the culture. Mm -hmm. Are you upset that the Nightmare TV series ended? Well, you know what happened with the Nightmare TV series? We went into that with the understanding that we were going to be on really late at night mm -hmm. syndication. And what happens is once they buy your show, they can put you on any time they want. Mm -hmm. And many of our shows were just really violent. They were like, it would be like if Tales of the Crypt was on at like 6 o'clock mm -hmm. syndicated instead of on HBO at, at 11 o'clock at night. Or on Fox at 11 o'clock, or now if it's on Fox at 9 yeah. o'clock at night, but it's on Fox, mm -hmm. which is the new network. But that and, and that and that hurt us. We would get we, we would get canceled, or or sponsors would drop out because we would we would we would not write to be on at six o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. We needed to be on at like after 11. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and and that that's what hurt me. Although a lot of our directors have gone on to much bigger and better things. Was Craven involved in the series? They promised, they promised to, to to shoot that show in no less than six days. Yeah. And we began shooting it in 10 days. And by the last season, we were shooting it in four. Mm. Wow. And just, they, they reneged on, on the, the budget and on the, t the shooting schedule. Now, Craven wasn't involved with the series, was no, he? No, not at all. But, but you know, Gil Adler, who was, a, was able to get us in under the, under the wire the last season, he learned so much doing that last season that he's the guy that was able to bring the budget down on Tales of the Crypt. And that's yeah. why Tales of the Crypt is still around, because Tales of the Crypt its first year was like, uh, it was almost like a pet toy. Mm -hmm. it's, it was so expensive. It had no, no sense of reality in terms of television programming. I mean, you know, it's like a million dollars an episode or something. Out of personal opinion, do you think the Craven Freddy's were the best? I, you know, I think Wes is certainly the most, the first one is certainly the scariest. Mm -hmm. And I love the evolution of Wes Craven's new nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that part three and four, seen together, are a great double bill mm -hmm. and, 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 and a terrific little double bill and really go well together because they have the overlapping characters, you know, there's a nice overlap there. 
Now, on the last one, when that's on TV, of course, they can't do the Freddy vision. Do you think that really hurts the film when you see it on TV that way without having the effect? Well, you know, I, I, I sort of thought they, you know, they would, like, solve that. I mean, you know, you know, what with all the technology we have now. But again, these movies have a ceiling on them with a the budget, whereas a James Cameron movie doesn't, you know? And that was a problem. I mean, I love the idea of going to a Freddy marathon in two years. And when that one comes on, everybody has to put on those 3D glasses, yeah. you know. I mean, I think that's just a great hoot and a great gimmick, and I think there should be more of that in event, you know, film going. But, uh, no, I don't think for, for TV, I think it's a problem. You get a kick out of all the uh, little Freddies running around on Halloween, and have they ever come into your door? Oh, yeah, they, they, they did a, a, a claw made out of paraffin on my, uh, on my brick walk last year, a couple of years ago. Nancy's got a picture of it in our scrapbook. And I, a couple of years ago, I was... In New York, doing a, what's the big night club there? Um, trying to think. Uh, the big night club. It's not as hip as it was anymore. I think it, maybe it was area or something mm -hmm. like that. But there was this big hip night club. And I was doing the midnight show live uh, on there, on radio there, mm -hmm. uh, broadcast. And it was a big costume contest and everything. And I was flying in, and we were late. And we were zooming through New York in the limo trying to get there on time. And I mean literally taking turns on two wheels. <laughs> driving a little too fast, and we, tur we turned down some side streets down in the east side, lower east side, where this, this big nightclub was, and uh, we came to a stop, and there in the crosswalk was a mother dressed as Freddy Krueger. <laughs> she had like six little Freddy Kruegers walking behind <laughs> in the crosswalk. She looked like, a, looked like a duck with her ducklings. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's sort of my, my seminal Freddy <laughs> Halloween. Now, the claw itself, now those are real knives, right? Well, there's several that we use. I mean, there's one for fight scenes, and there's one for when I have to cut things. Yeah, but it's but the construct is that it's, it's a, a leather gardening glove, and it's been shrunk in salt water to fit me real well. And then it, on the back, like armor on a, on a, knight, on a knight's glove is, um, is copper. Did you ever get hurt with that thing? The knives, the fish knives on the fingers. Yeah, did you ever get hurt with that thing? Um, yeah, on part four in the church sequence. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a sequence where the, the girl does, you know, stunts down the, down the aisle of the church and I grab her. Mm -hmm. And we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And it was a stunt girl. And when we did it, she, she wasn't on her mark. And it was either stab her or me, stab me. So I stabbed myself, mm -hmm. you know, because I had to, like, kind of pantomime grabbing her. Mm -hmm. And when I reached around to keep from hurting her because she was off her mark, I, I stabbed my other arm. Mm -hmm. bad. But that's the only time out of all the movies that I've... I'm, Lisa Zane broke my nose uh, in the reshoots of uh, Freddy's Dead. <laughs> uh, and I took the makeup off, you know, like, you know, ten hours later, and there was blood all over my face underneath the makeup. I didn't realize it. Ooh. Is that pretty much the worst thing that's happened to you on a set? I, well, let's see. Um, I mean, I've, you know, I've worked a lot with fire, and that's pretty bad. And on the, on the movie Ford Fairlane, uh, I did a lot of my own kickboxing and that, and all my own fight scenes and that, and I, I tore a pretty ugly, uh, I, I, I tore myself a hernia on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's about it. How are you going to spend your Halloween? This Halloween? I think, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to be on location. I'm not sure. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that I'm going to be doing a little uh, uh, strange project in Spain. I was supposed to go do the Colonel Schwarzenegger Caracol project this year. Mm -hmm. But it's been put on the back burner or indefinitely now <laughs> because of the budget. Yeah. And uh, uh, so I, I'm trying to get another gig in Europe. And this one, it looks interesting. It's directed by a guy who directs uh, European MTV. Mm. And, and there's a lot of talented people working in, that, in those videos. So I'm kind of you know, looking forward to that if it, if it, if it comes together. Any comes other uh, projects you can mention other than uh, the ones well, that you I'm, mentioned? I'm, you know, I'm going to be doing uh, uh, a movie of the week. That's real interesting. What is that? Cook, who wrote Coma. Right? Not, he didn't write Coma. He wrote the screenplay for Coma, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's coming up. I'm not sure the title of that, but it's kind of neat. It's kind of like, you know, a, it's really, it's not really horror, but it's sort of like a thriller in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Are you still interested in doing dramatic roles, too? Well, this is a dramatic role. Oh, okay. Yeah. I play a, a Boston uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you this. Uh, if Freddy Krueger... We're to wish our readers a happy Halloween. What do you think he'd say? I think he'd say, uh, uh, have fun, piggies. Uh, I'm staying home. I leave Halloween for the amateurs. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so very much. I appreciate this talk. I really okay. do. Uh, one last thing I'd like to ask you uh, is, is there a possibility, uh, I know I have to get with Matt Monday because we need to get some, some slides from him yeah. for the magazine, but what we would like to ask you is, could we get an autograph uh, photo from you or signed, something signed or something signed you know, to. What you want to do is just just give all that information to Matt on Monday. Okay. Just have Matt give it to me, and uh, Nancy and I'll send get something out to you. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay. And good luck to you, and we look forward to seeing your new movie in Nightmare. Okay, great. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now.